Welcome everyone, and thank you for joining us for our presentation titled Applications of High Throughput Gene Expression Profiling in Early Drug Discovery. It's my pleasure to introduce you to Peter Mestach, a senior scientist at the BioGazelle and associate professor of the Faculty of Medicine and Health Sciences at Penn University in Belgium. For complete biography of our speaker, please visit the tab at the top of your screen. Now, if any questions arise during the presentation, we encourage you to submit those questions in the Q&A box. Our speaker will address your questions following the end of the presentation. Please join me now in welcoming our presenter. Peter, you may now present your presentation. Welcome, sir. So thank you for the introduction and um, uh, thank you for attending. Um, what I would like to do today is introduce uh, a novel technology, or basically two novel technologies that we have developed to enable high throughput gene expression profiling um, with applications in uh, the various phases of early drug discovery. Um, the technologies I would like to present today are shown here. They're called HD Pathway Seek and HD Target Seek. So HT Pathway Seek is a technology that enables high throughput gene expression profiling to reveal pathway level information. Um, and from the path level information, uh, various aspects relevant during early drug discovery can be inferred. For instance, the mechanism of action of your compounds, molecular toxicity profiles that may be induced or repressed by your compounds of interest or molecular similarities between compounds that have been identified during early phases or early stages of drug discovery. On the other hand, uh, I will also talk about a derivative technology called HD Target Seek. So HD Target Seek goes beyond HD Pathway Seek in a sense that it goes beyond generating pathway level information, but also generates gene level information and more specifically differential gene expression. Uh, information. And we believe this technology can play a very important role during phases of oligonucleotide drug development. And more specifically, um, identifying on and off target effects induced by uh, oligonucleotide drugs, for instance, antisense oligonucleotides or SIRNAs. Now, I want to um, just take a few minutes to, re to, to make sure I position uh, the technology. Um, and that it's clear where uh, we believe this can play a role. So during the early phases of drug discovery, what you would uh, uh, typically do once you have identified a number of compounds of interest uh, that target uh, um, your target of interest, is that you can use various uh, types of assays to establish the activity of those compounds. So these could be simple reporter assays or certain phenotypic readouts. But these assays are typically um, uh, relatively simple in their readout and therefore do not pro uh, do not reveal a lot of information on, uh, let's say, the mechanism of action uh, of your compound and what happens really uh, at the molecular level. And so uh, what we believe is that, and, and we together with others, is that um, RNA profiling during those stages of drug development could actually help in further characterizing, prioritizing the drugs that are under investigation during these stages. So RNA profiling has a lot of upside potential here. Um, you can use the RNA profile to establish activity of pathways and, and, and biological functions. Um, this type of information can complement your phenotypic readout and help to further prioritize uh, your drugs. So you really have access to an extensive molecular profile derived from these um, um, our, um, RNA profiling studies. And uh, important uh, to mention also is that um, generating an RNA profile is really a generic test. Huh? Um, gene expression profiling does not depend on the type of cell line that you're using, type of compound that you're applying to your cells, uh, the type of target that you have. It's really a generic test that does not require any customization uh, depending on the project, uh, the target, the cell line, and so on. Of course, there's a number of technology requirements involved in order to implement such 
um, uh, to implement RNA profiling during drug development. And for, uh, the first requirement is that your technology needs to be compatible with a high throughput setting. So the technology should allow you to profile several compounds at several different concentrations and different cell lines all in one experiment and in a cost-effective manner, of course. And secondly, um, your technology should also provide you with sufficient coverage of the transcriptome to enable you to infer activities of pathways and to generate molecular profiles in a robust and reliable manner. RNA sequencing is obviously a technology that um, matches all of those criteria. So RNA sequencing allows us to profile the expression of thousands of genes. Um, however, in its current classic form, um, it's not really amenable to high throughput applications and uh, it's not really cost effective. So we decided to develop a technology that uh, we termed HD Pathway Seek that allows us to apply an RNA sequencing technology, but really in a high throughput and cost effective uh, um, setup. And uh, the way this works is shown here. So basically we're applying this uh, RNA sequencing technology di directly to crude cell lysates. And this, of course, has a number of advantages because um, we're circumventing cumbersome RNA extraction, laborious RNA extraction steps. So the library preparation is actually performed directly on cell lysate. So basically, you treat your cells in 96 wild cell culture plates with your compounds of interest or other uh, uh, genetic perturbations that you want to apply to those cells. You lyse the cells. Uh, we typically uh, recommend to use four biological replicates per condition. You lyse the cells. And the, on those lysates, we actually uh, perform this technology. So it's a tree prime and RNA sequencing based technology. And again, libraries are generated directly from cell lysates. Another important uh, thing to, um, to note here is the fact that we apply shallow RNA sequencing. So in the HD pathway seq approach, we will only generate on average 1 million reads for each of the samples. For HD target seq, we increase that number to 5 million. I will come back to that later. But so sequencing these lysates at 1 million read coverage, uh, we on average uh, detect around 7,000 genes in each of the samples. And then of course, there's a number of data analysis procedures that will reveal uh, underlying pathway changes. So let me just quickly show you some, some quality data of, of this procedure. So this is HD pathway seq data uh, applied to 384 different samples, which is a typical uh, number of samples that we include in a single experiment. So we can, of course, do multiple experiments. Um, so on the left-hand side, you can see the cumulative fraction of the number of detected genes. So you can see that on average, this is around 7,000 genes. In some samples, it's a bit less. In other samples, it's a bit more. Uh, the middle plot shows you the read coverage. So you can see that the read coverage is really focused at the three prime end of the genes, hence three prime end sequencing, of course. And in the right hand side, you can see uh, the reproducibility of the read counts that are generated. So these are technical replicates that are included in the same plate. And so you can see a very high reproducibility despite the fact that these libraries are generated directly on cell lysates and were sequenced at very shallow uh, sequencing depth of 1 million reads. Next step is, of course, data analysis. So what is typically done is differential gene expression analysis between different uh, uh, conditions of interest, uh, your compounds compared to vehicle, vehicle controls or other negative controls, so any type of comparison is possible, followed by a gene set enrichment analysis to reveal the pathways that are significantly activated or repressed um, in each of uh, the conditions in your experiment. And so we use gene set enrichment analysis because it's a very sensitive approach. Um, and uh, it has been shown, in, at least in the class of non-topology-based uh, pathway analysis tools, to uh, basically outperform all of the other tools that uh, are available. We use various types of gene set collections, both publicly available gene set collections from the molecular signatures database, but also custom gene sets that you may have um, available. We also did some analysis to uh, demonstrate that even with just 7,000 genes, you can actually reveal all the relevant pathways that are differentially expressed upon a certain perturbation. 
And so to do so, we simulated uh, situations using real life data sets. These are three different real life data sets where we either use all of the genes to do a differential gene and pathway uh, analysis or just use the 7,000 most abundant genes, which are typically the ones that we detect with HD pathway seq, and then compare to the output of the pathway analysis. And as you can see here, um, the pathways that are shared between both conditions, so being uh, uh, on the one hand side using all of the genes, on the other side uh, using um, only the 7,000 most abundant genes, you can see that the majority of the pathways that are identified are actually shared between both conditions. Meaning that even with just 7,000 genes, you can basically retrieve uh, the relevant pathways that are either activated or inactivated in your data set. So we believe this methodology can actually reveal insights in the mechanism of action uh, of your compound. It can reveal insights in certain box pathways that uh, um, may uh, be activated uh, upon uh, compound treatment. Um, but we can also use it, for instance, to compare um, the profiles uh, you have uh, uh, generated with your compounds of interest to profiles uh, generated um, for drugs with established uh, mechanisms uh, of action. And I just want to show you, uh, uh, briefly highlight a few of the analyses that are possible and some data demonstrating uh, the, the, the power of this uh, procedure. So this is, uh, these are results from a project that we did where uh, we screened actually 90 different compounds, um, including vehicle controls and some compounds with known mechanisms of action as positive controls in the screen. So for a total of 380 samples, more or less, and uh, so one of the positive control compounds in this case was, for instance, TSA, uh, trichostatin A. It's an HTAC inhibitor. And so when we did the, the, the HD pathway seq analysis uh, for those samples, the, the, the differential gene expression analysis, pathway enrichment, and so on, um, we could clearly see uh, HTAC-related pathways, pathways related to TSA treatment, uh, appearing among the top differentially expressed pathways uh, induced by this TSA treatment, uh, by this TSA compound. So suggesting that HD pathways it can indeed identify relevant pathways that are associated to uh, the drug's mechanism of action. You can also reveal those dependent relationships between uh, compound concentration on the one hand and pathway activation on the other hand. So on the left, you see an example of a compound where uh, certain pathways are only induced at the highest concentration. On the right hand side, you can see in a, an example of a compound where the pathways are already uh, induced uh, at the lowest concentrations. And you see a very nice dose dependent increase in pathway activity for the specific compounds. And you can really look at those relationships between co compound concentration and pathway activation or repression. You can also compare compounds uh, relative to each other based on their underlying molecular phenotype. So based on the gene expression data and pathway level expression data that's generated, you can actually create what we call compound similarity matrices, where you can compare compounds relative to each other and identify compounds that induce a similar molecular phenotype. This is information you can afterwards correlate, for instance, to the chemical structure of the compounds or correlate to the cellular phenotype that is induced by those compounds. Finally, uh, an, 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 an another application is uh, basically using those molecular profiles to reveal potential tox pathways. So a number of canonical tox pathways have been defined. Some of them are listed here, like DNA damage, oxidative stress, ER stress, and so on. And so for each of these tox pathways, we have one or multiple gene sets that represent tox pathway activity. And so what we can then do is to look at the induction or repression of these pathways for each of the compounds included in the screen. And by doing so, you could be able to upfront uh, during uh, those early phases of drug discovery, already try to predict or get insights into potential toxicity uh, mechanisms that are activated uh, when adding your compound uh, to, to the cells or evaluate at what concentration do you start to see induction of certain uh, unwanted toxicity pathways. 
Now, this entire technology comes with uh, a very diverse suite of data analysis tools that actually allow you to uh, browse and navigate through uh, all of the information because it's a lot of information that's being generated in a single experiment. And so these tools that we have developed actually allow you to browse through all of that information in a, a user-friendly way. And I will just briefly show you uh, what the tool uh, can do. So this is a, a tool that uh, you can access once uh, the data has been generated and uploaded. This is something that is part of uh, standardly, in, standardly in, integrated into these projects. So you can get overviews, more general overviews of the results, or go into more detail into individual contrasts, and again, look at toxicity, similarity, and so on. I'll just highlight a few things. So you can get an overview. This is an experiment with 72 different um, uh, compounds. Uh, you can get an overview of the number of positively and negatively enriched pathways and gene sets for each of the contrasts, but you can also zoom in on certain contrasts, for instance, a certain compound in a certain cell line that was administered in different concentrations, and then see how the number of enriched gene sets is correlated, for instance, in this case, to the concentration of the compounds. So this is, again, a very nice example of a compound where you see a dose-dependent impact on activated and repressed pathways in these cells. You can also zoom in to individual contrasts. This is, again, the example of the trichostatin A that was added uh, at a certain concentration to a certain cell line. And you can actually pull up or uh, reveal all of the significantly enriched gene sets that are either activated or repressed upon treatment with the compound, with all of the statistics associated to them links that allow you to uh, reveal more information about the content of these gene sets. And you can also select individual gene sets and reveal uh, the underlying uh, data, so the gene set enrichment analysis plots. And to the right-hand side, a table showing you which genes from that gene set are actually contributing to the enrichment. So the so-called core enrichment genes that actually drive uh, the enrichment. So for all of these genes, you get individual statistics. Again, uh, what was their fault change um, in, the, um, in the experiment and so forth. You can also reveal uh, two-dimensional uh, plots uh, or, or uh, generate two-dimensional plots that reveal relationships uh, between uh, different treatments. So these are different compounds that are clustered here. Um, in a two-dimensional Disney plot, um, allowing you to reveal uh, whether certain compounds are more similar or more related uh, to each uh, um, compared to others. Um, and uh, finally, you can also reveal these toxicity profiles, these toxicity maps, where these canonical tox pathways are um, shown and um, with indication whether they are positively, positively or negatively enriched uh, for each of the, the compounds uh, and, and the conditions included in the screen. So a number of tools that allow you to browse uh, through the results to generate figures that you can download um, and so on. So that's HT Pathway Seek, and I want to go one step further and talk about, let's say, a derivative technology that is, uh, I mean, from, a, from an analytical point of view and a technological point of view, uh, identical to HT Pathway Seek, but uh, differs in the fact that um, we generate a bit more reads, we sequence a bit deeper to enable really gene expression level uh, analysis. And um, we're positioning this technology uh, really in the field of uh, oligonucleotide drug development, where it could have a number of applications. So um, oligonucleotide drug development, for instance, antisense oligonucleotides as iRNAs. So these uh, processes typically involve several hundreds of candidates uh, that are screened for their um, impact on reducing target expression. Um, they're typically also selected based on the on-target knockdown efficiency. But we know, of course, that these molecules also have uh, a number of, of target genes. And what we think this uh, HT target seek technology can do is to help reveal those off-target genes. Um, and having access to that information can actually guide or further steer oligonucleotide drug development. You can, for instance, evaluate whether certain chemical modifications may improve uh, the off-target repertoire, whether formulation of dosing or dosing has an, an impact on the off-target repertoire, you name it. 
A second application uh, is not in oligonucleotide drug development, but actually in repurposing uh, data from uh, siRNA or shRNA library screens. So um, these screens um, are typically uh, um, or can be heavily affected by off-target effects as well. And it's been shown in, in, in several research papers that gaining insights in the off-target effects that are induced during these uh, uh, siRNA library screens, that these insights can actually reveal novel players in the pathways that are being studied and potentially reveal novel therapeutic targets. And I will come back to that later to show you uh, an, uh, a, an, a study that we've done and that actually uh, allowed us to do that. Now, um, the way this is normally achieved is uh, purely from a bioinformatics uh, uh, point of view, um, where um, the mechanism by which these off-target effects are induced are actually used to predict uh, for each of the siRNAs that you would in, uh, have in such a screen, um, predict what their off-target repertoire could be. So you probably know or you don't know that um, off-target genes induced by siRNAs are actually um, of target genes induced to a microRNA-like action of siRNA, so through seed binding, in complementary seed uh, binding um, between the siRNA and uh, the target messenger RNA. Uh, this is how of target genes are being induced. And so there's a number of uh, tools that have been developed that purely rely on bioinformatic predictions of off target genes using the siRNA seed sequence. Um, but there's a number of disadvantages when relying only on bioinformatic approaches. So first of all, uh, you can have many false positive predictions. Yeah? Um, the seed sequences that we are referring to here are very short sequences, six, seven nucleotides in length. So you can find a, typically a lot of matches uh, for these sequences uh, in UTRs of, uh, of, of messenger RNAs. So a lot of false positive predictions. And on top of that, these predictions do not provide you any information on the magnitude of the off-target effects. So you may have an off-target that uh, is regulated, is, is repressed by 20%, or some other off-target genes may be repressed by 80 or 90%. So there's no information on the magnitude of the effect if you only rely on bioinformatic approaches to predict off-targets of, uh, of oligonucleotides, in this case, in this example, is siRNAs. So by integrating gene expression data and on top of that differential gene expression analysis, you can actually further fine tune the selection and the repertoire of, of targets in such an experiment. So by combining genes that are downregulated upon siRNA treatment with the presence or absence of seed binding sites for the siRNA that was included in the experiment, um, you can actually further narrow down uh, the list of uh, of target genes, fine tune it, and on top of that, also get an idea on the magnitude of the effect the siRNA has on its off target repertoire. Of course, doing that again requires uh, methods that enable high throughput gene expression profiling, a very cost effective method. And this is again where, in this case, HD Target Seek uh, kicks in. So it's the same technology as HD Pathway Seek. It's also performed directly on cell lysates. Um, the only difference is that instead of generating 1 million reads per sample, we uh, go a bit higher here. We go for 5 million reads per sample. So it's five times higher sequencing depth. Why? Because um, it, it will provide you with a bit more coverage on uh, genes. You have to identify a bit more genes and really be able to do reliable differential gene expression analysis. Uh, so going beyond the pathway level analysis where you're combining information from multiple genes and then it's not that important to have highly accurate gene expression readouts. Whereas if you really want to focus on the individual gene readouts and differentially expressed genes, you need to have sufficient coverage. So um, as mentioned, I want to uh, show what this technology can do uh, using a case study uh, where we have applied HD target seek in an siRNA screen repurposing study. Uh, so in this case, this was an siRNA screen that was uh, performed in the context of fibrosis, uh, where the readout was a TGF beta driven phenotype, so the TGF beta reporter readout. Um, 1,716 genes were actually screened uh, using this library approach with three different siRNAs per gene. So a total of close to 5,000 siRNAs that were screened for their activity to 
induce or, or repress this TGF beta driven uh, phenotype and readout. So HITs were basically genes that would repress TGF beta signal upon knockdown. And typically those screens will reveal two types of um, two types of HITs, two types of genes. The example of gene A is an example where all three siRNAs give knockdown of the target, in this case gene A, and will also induce the phenotype of interest. So gene A here is a gene that will be classified as a HIT, um, where, uh, meaning that gene A is involved in repressing, uh, in this case, TGF beta signal. But a number of cases are actually more like gene B, where um, all of the siRNAs would induce target knockdown, but only one of the siRNAs induces the phenotype of interest. So suggesting here that siRNA3 directed against gene B is actually mediating the phenotype through of target effects, not by knocking down gene B, but really by knocking down one or multiple of target genes. And so identifying those genes could reveal novel players in uh, the pathway of interest. So there's a lot of hidden information in these library screens that can be revealed by applying this HD target seek technology. And I will show you uh, what we've done in this case. So 86 siRNAs were selected that show to this type of behavior. So with presumed off-target effects, uh, a number of positive controls and negative controls were also included, uh, amongst others, siRNAs against the TGF beta receptor 1 and 2 um, as uh, known uh, repressors. Well, if you would knock down TGF beta receptor 1 or 2, you would get repression of TGF beta signaling. So these were the positive controls. So applying HT target seek to, again, this was a total of around 384 samples. Um, I'll just show you some of the results from the positive controls and then move to the, uh, the off-target siRNAs. So here you can see siRNA against TGF beta receptor 1 on the left, uh, TGF beta receptor 2 on the right. Um, we can, the, the method reveals very clear knockdown of uh, TGF beta receptor 1 expression and TGF beta receptor 2 expression. We can also see that at the pathway level, these knockdowns are functional. You can see uh, a lot of TGF beta related gene sets that are significantly repressed in both of those positive control conditions. So, suggesting that we are uh, capable of detecting differential expression of individual genes and also of uh, individual pathways. Um, so when doing differential expression analysis for the siRNAs of interest, those 86 siRNAs with presumed of target effects, it was really interesting, interesting to see that uh, for most, if not all, of the siRNAs, we could identify a few dozen, up to several hundreds of genes that were significantly repressed uh, when uh, um, uh, treating the cells with those individual siRNAs. So we could identify both upregulated and downregulated genes, but with a clear uh, bias towards the downregulated genes. So many more downregulated genes and upregulated genes, suggesting that there's a number of off-targets there that may be responsible for driving the phenotype that these siRNAs are inducing. So the proof of the pudding is in the eating. And so if this is really the case, then what we expect to see is that genes that have a seed site for these uh, siRNAs are actually preferentially downregulated in the data. So uh, before I show you the results, I just want to quickly um, uh, give us or give a brief overview of uh, um, these different seed matches that we consider. So this is coming from uh, the microRNA world, where you have the canonical seed matches being a six nucleotide seed match, a seven nucleotide seed match. There are two different types of seven nucleotide seed matches that they're called a seven mer M8 or a seven mer A1. I won't go into too much detail. We don't have time for that. Uh, or the eight mer uh, seed match. So an eight nucleotide seed match. Um, and basically, these go in. These are, are are ordered here with the increasing efficiency. So the six nucleotide seed matches are typically less efficient than the seven nucleotide seed matches, which are less efficient than the eight nucleotide seed matches in repressing target expression. So what we expect to see if, if this is this phenomenon is indeed playing a, a, a role here in in the data, and that's what of course you hope to see because that's the entire hypothesis, is that if you look at genes uh, that have a six mer, a seven mer A1, a seven mer M8, or an eight mer site, that you would see a proportional increase in the fold down regulation of these genes compared to genes that don't have any match, any seed match with the siRNA. And that's exactly what we see. So in the middle plot, you can see the cumulative distribution of the fault changes for genes that don't have a seed match in black compared to genes that have a 6-mer, a 7-mer, or an 8-mer seed match. 
And on the right-hand side, you can basically see the median log to fold changes, where indeed you see a proportional increase in the log to fold change down regulation when going from no to 6MER to 7MER A1, 7MER M8, and 8MER. So really proving and validating that this technology can reveal a CRNA of target effects when applied in such a setting on cell lysates. So in order to prioritize the most important uh, of target genes in this um, in this setting, we uh, looked for of target genes that were actually recurrent among multiple of the siRNAs that were included in the screen. So we decided to focus on of target genes that had at least one eight MER site and of target genes that were at least down regulated twofold. And so when counting uh, for every of those genes, how many times we observed such an off-target gene across the 86 different siRNAs, we get the frequency table that is shown on the, um, on the plots, uh, uh, on the slide here on the right. And uh, what was very revealing is that the second most frequent off-target gene that was identified was actually TGF beta receptor 1 itself, which of course made total sense as this is one of the major drivers of TGF beta receptor signaling. So this is really proving that we can use that technology to identify relevant of target genes from such an siRNA repurposing screen. And also interesting to see was that several other uh, of these top rank genes were also known components of the TGF beta pathway. And interestingly, of course, for uh, the customer in this case is that there were several genes in there that had not been associated to TGF beta pathway activity before. So, um, I want to conclude by, by reiterating that the technologies I presented here today, being HD Pathway Seek and HD Target Seek, are high throughput RNA sequencing technologies that are performed directly on cell lysates. There's no need for RNA extraction, so they have the capability to, to be performed in high throughput in a really cost effective manner. Manner. So basically, all you need to do, is, to do is treat your cells with your compounds or antisense or siRNA nucleotides um, of uh, uh, siRNAs of interest. Um, lyse your cells, ship the lysates, and, and that's basically it. Uh, we run HD pathway seek, HD target seek, together with uh, all the proper data analysis directly on uh, the shipped lysates, and provide you back, of course, with, uh, with the results. So with that, I want to end. Uh, also thank a few people uh, that have been involved in the development uh, of these technologies at Biogazelle. Um, and also uh, especially uh, thank Galapagos um, so for allowing us to share the results from the fibrosis siRNA screen. Um, and uh, I'll uh, leave it here and uh, thank you for uh, listening. Thank you for attending and I'm happy to take uh, any of your questions. Thanks. Thank you, Peter, for that outstanding presentation. And we will now move into the live Q&A portion of the presentation. And as a reminder to our audience members, please submit your questions via the Q&A box. <clears throat> so Peter, let's take a look. We already have some great questions coming in from our audience members. And it looks like that we are not seeing you on your camera. Can you hear me, Peter? <clears throat> now I'll just thank our audience for their patience. That does happen on occasion. And <clears throat> it looks like he is trying to get back on camera. So Peter, if you could just go ahead and turn your camera back on, we will begin the live Q&A portion with our audience. <clears throat> and again, thank you for these technical difficulties. They do happen on occasion. <clears throat> and I see that there are already some great questions. So if you haven't asked a question, go ahead and use that Q&A box and um, we will begin. All right, it looks like he is about to hop on. <clears throat> I 
Um, Peter, if you can hear me, please turn on your camera and the right. I'm just going ahead and texting him and letting him make sure we get him back in here. Every once in a while, this happens, and I hope that all of you are enjoying this conference. So far, it has been fabulous. I know I've seen a few of you from room to room um, in our studios today, but if you haven't had a chance to check out the agenda, there are quite a few more workshops and uh, seminars throughout the day um, following this one. So we hope that you will join us for other webinars as well. And um, it looks like he is still trying to figure it out. <clears throat> this is where I think audience members begin to see how long I can possibly stall. <laughs> and I appreciate all of your patience. Um, it looks like he is almost in here. Let me go ahead and respond. Please go to the bottom. Okay, I've gone ahead and asked him to exit the studio and then come back in. And I hope that the people that are attending will stick around because I think he, we are, I already see the questions that have come in and I think it is going to be a great live Q and A. So again, bear with me as we wait for him to log out. So he just logged out and now he's logging back in and we should see him pop up. Um, I also want to encourage you to work on that survey. So I know we've asked you a few questions um, and we appreciate your feedback on that as you proceed through the different various webinars. Um, Peter, can you hear me? I can hear you. Hi, can you hear me? Yay, there he is. Yeah, finally, okay. And I will tell Got you what a great... I will tell you what a great audience we have. Every single one of them are still in the studio. So thank you okay. to our live audience. We appreciate that. Um, welcome back, Peter. And we will we'll go ahead and begin our Q&A. And it looks like our audience members have already provided some great questions. So thank you all for your patience. Our first question, Peter, is can this method also be used with tissues or biofluids? Yeah, so um, thanks for that question. Um, so basically uh, what I showed in the presentation is that uh, we typically work on cell lysates. Um, this works, this approach works well with cultured cells and these are easy to lysate. Uh, if you work with tissues or biofluids, um, we would need to introduce an intermediate step before applying the technology and that step would entail an RNA extraction um, uh, um, performed on the fluid or, or on the tissue before able to do the library preparation. So the method is compatible, the library preparation method uh, and, and everything downstream of it is compatible with tissues the only for an extraction uh, on those tissues or biofluids and um, uh, deliver the RNA in 96 well plates, for instance. So it, it can work given that you And Peter, thank you so much. Um, our next question is, are there any scenarios where you'd recommend using more than four replicates per condition? Um, so uh, uh, the replicates um, that we uh, suggest to use here is really a trade-off between, um, let's say, being sensitive enough and having sufficient uh, replicate sufficient power to detect differential genes on one hand and on the other hand uh, uh, stay cost effective 
Um, and this is always a trade-off. The more replicates you would include, um, the less cost-effective the method would become, of course. Your cost per condition would increase, uh, but, but you would gain power and would be able to identify, uh, let's say, uh, differential genes uh, that have potentially lower fold changes, a bit more warm, or that are lower abundant. Um, uh, I think um, uh, four is a, is a good, uh, good trade-off. Um, especially if you're focusing on differential pathway expression analysis, so the HD pathway seek procedure, um, for that four is, is optimal. Going lower would uh, reduce the sensitivity dramatically. This is something we simulate. Uh, going higher um, may have a small uh, gain in, in outputs, but potentially not dramatic, especially not at the pathway. At the gene level, that's a different story. Thank you so much, Peter. Our next question from our audience member, how about cells cultured in 3D, such as um, spheroids? Well, in principle, if you can uh, lyse the cells, um, then uh, the, the method can uh, work perf perfectly on those lysates. So if your uh, spheroid cultures can be lysed using uh, uh, the lysis protocol that we've um, this should work perfectly fine. What we always do is if we would deviate from what we standardly do, which is 2D cell cultures, we always do, um, let's say, a very small pilot where we ask uh, the customer to um, grow a few cells at the license buffer, ship us the lysates, and then we do a QC to evaluate whether we can indeed generate libraries from that type of material. Uh, so this is something we would uh, evaluate on a case-by-case -case basis, but I definitely do not. We have not done it before on the cultures, to be clear, uh, but I definitely don't exclude uh, the possibility that this could work, and it's very easy to test if it would work. Thank you so much, Peter. Now, what are the sensitivity limits of the technique in terms of number of cells per sample? Um, so this depends uh, in part on the cell type. Uh, some cells are more transcriptionally active than others. So um, depending on the cell type, you can get more RNA per cell. Um, what we typically, we typically in, in 96 well plates work with uh, cell numbers, 5,000, 10,000, 15,000 per cell. It also really depends on the cell culture conditions and the optimal conditions for the readout and the experiment itself and the treatment and so on. So all of these things need to be taken into account. Um, the lower the cell number, um, or let's say the lower uh, the RNA content uh, of the lysates, uh, the, the few genes that the method will detect. For pathway analysis, uh, this is quite robust. So even when, when decreasing the number of genes going from 7,000 to 6,000 to 5,000, you would still be able to detect the majority of differential pathways. For differential gene expression analysis, of course, this would uh, have an impact. Thank you so much. And we have time for a couple of more questions. Peter, how long would it take to see these newly identified as a, uh, RNAs applied to fibrosis patients? So I guess this is related to the, the, the case uh, I presented uh, in the context of fibrosis where we looked at this RNA of targets. Um, I don't know if the question is uh, um, related to how long it would take to see the off-target effects uh, of those SIRNAs in patients. Um, that's not something we have investigated. So what we have done is really the in vitro work, the upfront work where uh, we looked at uh, off-target genes for SIRNAs in uh, that were identified uh, from this screen. Um, how long these it would take for these effects to manifest themselves in, in patient samples is uh, not something I've investigated. So, thank you so much. Um, we have one more final question. How do you deal with variation in sample concentrations across different wells? Um, because I see that the connection is a bit. Um, so we, as before, we, we actually start 
libraries are generated. Every library is one of 384 library experiments are really quantified and booled. Uh, to uh, based on the library concentration in order to obtain an Ike Muller pool and to get an even redistribution across samples. So there's an, an, a step involved that takes care of this. Peter, I want to thank you again for your presentation today and for your important research. And I also I want to take the moment and thank our audience members for their patience and their questions. Any questions submitted but not presented at the end of the Q&A today will be answered via email by the address that you provided in your contact information. Thank you again, Peter, and thank you to the audience. This presentation will be available for on-demand viewing for 12 months, and please remember to share it with your colleagues who may have be interested in the topic today. And don't miss out on the other presentations in our agenda. Visit the agenda tab in the auditorium for a full listing. Thank you again, Peter, and thank you all. Until next time, take care, stay safe, stay healthy. Bye-bye. Okay. Thank you so much. Thanks for, uh, for listening. Thanks for attending. Bye-bye.